Do me a favor real fast, put your hands together as loud as you possibly can, and let's welcome all of our other campuses. What's up, everyone? Why don't you clap back to us everywhere else? Limerick, Royersford, Plymouth, Meany, Montgomeryville. If you're by yourself, you can clap by yourself. That might be a little awkward, and it's good to be with you. I'm glad that the snow did not cancel our Sunday, and so it might have impacted a little bit, but I'm glad that we got to have church. A lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of prayer. Uh, a lot of work goes into Sunday morning because we believe uh, that God wants to do something incredible. And so I hate canceling church. Like, it's like, a, like when, when, when it snows like that, I'm like, devil, you're attacking on our Sunday. Like, snow on a Monday. Everybody hates Monday anyways. Just ruin Monday. And so unless you own a business and you're like, I hate you now. And so, but for, for me, you know, Sunday's a big deal. And so I'm glad that we didn't have to cancel church if you couldn't make it today because the roads were bad. Uh, we're glad that you're able to join us online. Uh, so you can keep, a lo- keep up with our, our sermon series we started last week called Hunting, Hunting History. And I said, listen, I want this year to be a historical moment for you and for our church. So collectively, I want God to do some stuff in our church. I'm going to start talking to you about that over the next few, few weeks, things that we're believing God for. And uh, I want you to see that in your personal life, whether it's, it's a relationship that you, you've been praying about. Uh, maybe one you're looking for, maybe one you want God, God's help in. Uh, it's a job, kind of your next step. And, and the thing when I talk about job, what I'm not talking about is your career. I'm talking about your calling. You have a career. You're always going to kind of switch from, from, from job to job, and you're never going to be satisfied. A calling is different, and you can be called to many different aspects. You don't have to preach or sing to be called by God. Uh, you can be called by God to teach. You can be called by God to plumb. You can be called by God to be a doctor. Find your calling. Maybe you've been praying through that, and you want to see God do that. Maybe it's a change in a, a, a major at a college. I'm not sure what it is you're looking for God to do. I believe God wants to do more than just give you knowledge this year. I don't believe that, that just coming to church and learning about the Bible is enough to sustain you. I think you need to watch the Bible actually come to, to action and power in your life. Can, do you agree with me? Don't you want to see God move in your life? And so last week I said, I said a lot of us want God to move, but we're not sure really how to go about that. And so we tend to think it's a, a, like a luck thing. Like, well, God moves in that person's life, and he doesn't move in my life. And what I started thinking about after my one experience with hunting, I'm not a hunter, and so, but I started thinking about it, finding, finding God's power looks a lot more like hunting than it does like what, what I do, which is just go to the grocery store. And so last week I said, I said, listen, God will do what you can't do in your life, but he will never do what you can do. In other words, he needs your participation. He needs you to be a part of what, what he's doing. And so last week I said, first step to hunting is you got to position yourself. you got to go out in the woods or wherever you hunt from. Got to, it, like, like, like most of the time, you're not going to sit on your back porch and shoot things, right? They're not just going to show up and say, here, dinner's here. You have to position yourself. You don't get to determine when that, that, that animal walks by, but you need to be there when it, when it does walk by. And so we talked about what it looks like to position yourself. I gave you three things. I said, man, you got to start being more faithful. If you ever want to see the power of God in your life, you got to be a faithful person. Uh, you got to, before you decide to do something, you got to be predetermined before you start to stay determined. You got to keep going. I like to say this to myself often. Me and my wife, we, you know, this might surprise you, but from time to time, uh, we want to quit. It's just, the way, it's just the way that it is. Like, you just get tired of it when it snows, when you're in the Northeast and it's snowing, and you're like, it's going to ruin. You know, I'm, I want to go to South Carolina, North Carolina, Hawaii, Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, you know, pretty much any other state besides Pennsylvania sometimes. And so, like, that's just where, where, where I land. And oftentimes, what, I, what, I, what I've told myself is, listen, just keep your head down, uh, keep your mouth shut, keep going. Keep your head down. Don't look at every, don't Listen, it's snowing. Don't look at your friend's church in Texas with the sun shining, right? <laughs> keep your head down. Keep your mouth. Don't complain. It's, it's winter, and we live in Pennsylvania. Haven't you ever seen the pictures of George Washington going across the Delaware? Stuff gets frozen here. So don't complain about it. Just keep your mouth shut and keep going. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your head down. Keep going predetermined to stay determined. And the position you should stay in is one of service. Serve the Lord with gladness. Keep serving the Lord. And so that was the position. Just so you know kind of where we're going, I have two more weeks after this. I'm pretty excited next week to talk about if you're a hunter, eventually you got to take the shot, right? Eventually you got to shoot something. And I'm going to talk to you about taking that shot because some of you are terrified. And I want you, I want you to know, what's the worst that can happen? Like I do that oftentimes. We're going to start a new campus. What's the worst that could happen? Well, Logically, it could close, you know, we could lose thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, everybody could get mad, something could blow up, blah, 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 blah. What's the best that could happen? God can move in a crazy way. 
What, what's the best thing? If you stay here and you, what's the worst that could happen? Man, next year might be difficult. What's the best that could happen? Next year could be amazing. Take the shot. Like, take the shot that God has given you. God loves and responds to big time faith. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so we're going to talk about that. And then the last week, I'm going to talk to you about what I think is the worst part of hunting, maybe, but maybe today is also the worst part. And so maybe just all of hunting is awful, but uh, the worst part of hunting, after you kill it, you got to drag it. Like, it doesn't just, you, you don't just, like, go, right? Like, you have to drag it. And the floor of the woods is not flat. I don't know if, you're, if you've ever done it. So when I hunted, I'm like, I'm like, why is there so many trees? On, and then why do we got to lift this dead flesh up? And why, why can't we just cut this thing out there and butcher? I got to drag it out here. And, and the truth is, when God calls you to something and he starts to move in your life, there's, there is a weight to that. There, there is a responsibility to handle in the call, a call of God. There's, there's what I would call dragging that responsibility, and sometimes it gets weighty, and so we're going to talk about that. Today, I want to talk to you on the topic of what I think maybe is the reason. Some people say, why don't you hunt for real? And so uh, it's, it's not because I, I'm like, I, I couldn't kill a deer, because I, I could kill a deer. Like, I'm not like that. I'm not like super, like, I don't have a heart like that. Like, when that deer died, I wasn't like, oh, look at Bambi. Like, I was like, this is gross, but I would do that, like that part of it, right? I, I, the gut in part was kind of gross, but also kind of brave ish and like, I just imagine, like, we were taking pictures of Troy when he was doing, he was covered in blood, and then I had some gloves on that still have blood, and somebody asked me, why didn't you wash your gloves off? I'm like, because this is real, like, this means that I'm a man, I got blood on my gloves now, and so, like, that part doesn't bother me, all that stuff. What I think is the worst part of hunting is going out and sitting and, and being patient. That's the, the act, like, just being quiet. Like, that is actually torture to my soul, to be quiet. Like, you know, like, just sitting in a tree and saying absolutely nothing and waiting around. But I did some studying this week, and they said that's actually probably the most important part of the hunt, developing the ability to, to, to wait. And the truth is, in our lives, we absolutely, unquestionably, what do we hate? We hate to wait. We hate, let's just do, let's just do a test. Okay, want to do a test with me? How many of you have Amazon Prime? And if you don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. It's 2020. Get Amazon Prime, right? How many of you, when you're looking at Amazon Prime or Amazon just in general, and you're going through things, and you look at it, and the one says, Amazon will ship in three to five days, and then you find something else, maybe a couple, couple dollars more expensive, and it says, we'll ship tomorrow? How many of you disqual disqualify and discredit everything that does not say Amazon Prime on it? I don't even look at that stuff. I don't want to wait three days. Sometimes it's even worse. Sometimes I'm on Amazon Prime, and uh, it's going to be there tomorrow, but I want it today. So I won't even wait. I'll just go to Target, right, and buy it, even though it's $20 more, $30 more, because I want it right now. Let me, let me give you, how many of you uh, use a GPS when you drive? You should, right? It's just dumb to try to be a hero. Don't be a hero. <laughs> and you put GPS in. How many of you, when you're, when you're on the GPS, you're like doing this with the screen because you want to see what's in front of you, right? And you want, especially when you're driving to Philadelphia, what don't you want to see on the GPS? Red. Red, red. red is the color of Satan, right? It's amazing. <laughs> That red, it means, and so you, you what, you, what do you do? I detour the heck out of my GPS until it gives me another route so that I don't have to wait at all at red. Let me give you some more examples. My kids, they, they, my, they, they have a phone, and so when they get home, they, they, they let us know they're home and all this stuff. And so uh, they, they've now discovered the art of texting, and, and they text, and the text will be like, hey, dad, are you there? And, and, the, and literally, I, I, I pull it out of my, my, my pants like this, and I look at it, and by the time it recognizes my face, or I put my code in, and I open it up, and I read, hey, the next thing is a question mark. And then it's a, are you there? And then it's followed by, dad. And then it's followed by, really? <laughs> Do you even care, right? And meanwhile, I haven't even read the first thing that was, hey, dad, are you there? And I've tried to instruct them, it doesn't work like that, right? You're going to have to figure this out, because God don't work like that either. You don't just text God and go, okay, God, now, right? And this is, I'm like, you have to develop the art of, of waiting. And so I want to talk to you about this because I think it's super, it's super important. I think if you don't figure this out, 
you will miss a lot of the great things that God wants to do in your life. I think you will, you will skip ahead. I think you will manipulate. I think you will stress out. I think you will just take whatever you can get. I think you will settle. I watch people do this in their careers, in their relationships, in, in, in almost every aspect of, of their lives. I watch people freak out in the wait and make decisions that impact the rest of, of their life. In fact, I want to show you how significant waiting is. I just typed in the word wait in, in my Bible study tool. And over 100 verses came up on the, the, the significance of waiting. And I don't have time to read 100, so I just want to read five to you. I want to show you how significant this is. And this is just a few of them. Psalms 27 says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and take heart. What does it say again? Do what? Come on, say it like you mean it. Wait, wait for the Lord. Just wait for the Lord. Watch what the next one says. Psalms 37 says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. What, what does that mean? You ever been doing the right thing and other people aren't doing the right thing and they're getting ahead of you? And you're like, why? Well, you know, these people have a lot more money. They have a nicer car than me because they don't pay taxes. And every year comes and I do all my taxes and I don't cut corners and, and I don't get to have the nice car. And I got this junk car. It only costs $400 a month. And they got a $700 Tesla. And I could do all this and I have a house, but I don't cut corners in my house. And I, got, and I do the right thing at my job and they don't do the right thing. And they're getting ahead. And meanwhile, I'm still waiting. What does the Bible say? Keep doing what? Keep waiting. Don't, don't freak out, it says. Psalms 130 says, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. Not only, not only do I wait in my action, but I wait in my attitude. I have the peace that surpasses all understanding. I, I wait for the Lord, and in his word, I put my hope. I, I, I wait for the Lord. Lamentations 3 says, the Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. That means I'm not posting crap online about how difficult my life is and how unfair it is and how unjust it is. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to keep my head down and keep my mouth shut. I'm going to wait for the Lord. Maybe the most famous one, maybe you read this on a, on, a, on a mug at some point or a bumper sticker. Isaiah 40 says, but those who hope or some versions say wait in the Lord will renew their strength. Bible says uh, they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be, be faint. Maybe there's something to the waiting thing. Maybe there's something to it. What I have found is, is, is life with God is a lot like a day at an amusement park. And uh, when you go to the amusement park, you spend $100, $200, whatever it is. Maybe you go to Dorney, get a deal, $69 or $70, whatever it is, $75, you know, a kidney, whatever you pay to get into an amusement park. And do, do you not spend the most, of, most of your day at an amusement park waiting in what? Right? You, you get up. Like, I, I, went to, I went to Universal, and, and we went to the Harry Potter world because we walked around to there. Uh, not because I've ever, I don't know anything about Harry Potter, but we went around there, and there was people absolutely freaking out about Harry Potter, grown people running around in robes in the middle of August in, 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 in Orlando. And so you have to be in love with something. Like, so see, I thought to myself, if I ever sent a text message to my church or an email to my church and said, hey, we don't have air conditioning, and it's August, Rarely anybody would show up, but people will run around in a wool Harry Potter, you know, dress with a fake wand playing with objects, pretend, and, and, and I, I was like, and then we went to this one ride, it was like the Harry Potter, I guess there was three big, big, big Harry Potter rides, we went to this one, and it said two and a half hour wait, two and a half, to ride a ride, you know how long the ride, I was like, how long does this ride last, like 20 minutes, or like, no, nah, like 13 seconds. And so it's like you wait in line, and then you get the experience. And what's the experience? Whee! This is amazing. Take my picture, right? And then you get back in line. And then you wait some more in line. You go around the thing. You know, you see things. Wait in line. And then you get on the roller coaster. And then you go back, and you wait in line. There's periods of eating and, 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 and going to the restroom. But for the most part, you wait in line, followed by 13 seconds of fun. Welcome to life with God. That is what I've found that following God is like. There's a lot of waiting on God. And then something great happens, and you're like, I can't believe that I get to be a part of this. And then as soon as you're done being a part of it, you're waiting again for the next thing. Why? Because he's consistently taking you to a new level. 
It's really important that you learn how to wait because if you don't learn how to wait, you will make some really stupid decisions in your life. In fact, one pastor a few years ago was preaching on a similar topic and he said these two lines and they have stuck with me and I wrote them down because even pastors need to be preached to, but I think they are literally, literally word gold. And this is what he said. He said, listen, if it is not God's time in your life, you can't force it. You can't force it. But if it is God's time, you can't stop it. If it's not God's time, don't, don't force it. You ever have a kid who tries to force something into a spot it's not supposed to be? I always think of that old toy that nobody really wants to play with anymore uh, because, because of computers, stuff like that, the little, the little blocks where you would shove the blocks into the hole and you would hammer them. And, you know, whoever bought that for your kids, you're like, why would you get that for my kids? It makes so much noise. And they would try to take the, 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 the triangle and shove it into the star or take the square and shove it into the circle. And it doesn't, it doesn't work. You lose something. And maybe you get it ed- ed- like edged in there and propped in there, but eventually you lose part of the shape. If, you, if it's not God's will, you can't force it. If it is God's will, you won't be able to stop it. And so what I want to do is I want to encourage you to embrace the weight. I believe the weight can be great if you look at it from a biblical perspective. And what I want to do is I want to drop you into a story in the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. And I want to introduce you to a guy that a couple years ago we spent a whole month talking about. We called the sermon series, Burn the Plow, Eat, Eat the Cow. If you were here, uh, we followed along this, this story of this man named, named Elisha. And the reason I love Elisha, he's a normal guy just like you and me. He's not a Bible college student. He's not grown up in a perfect home. You know, he's not at the top of his, his Torah class. He's, he's not the educated next guy, but he ends up becoming uh, the, the most popular, powerful prophet of God. Uh, he's just minding his own business. The Bible says that in the season before he becomes the prophet, that he's just running his family business. He's a farmer. He's, he's, he's out in the field. He's te- tilling it up. And, and, and he kind of like what I talked about last week. He's just faithful to the job. He's not really worried about what's next, what God's going to do. He's just faithful. He's determined. He's serving his family. And the Bible says in the book of 1 Kings chapter 19 that a man named Elijah shows up. I know it's kind of confusing. I don't know why that guy couldn't name was a little, little bit different. But Elijah and, and, and Elisha. And Elijah shows up. And this is like the most fa- one of the most famous dudes, you know, in the country coming to your house. Like you're just minding your own business you know, and Justin Bieber shows up, right, or, or whoever is famous to you, I don't know, I can't think of anybody famous, I have a life, and so, like, I, just famous people show up, and you just show up to your, to your doorstep, and like, really big deal in your line of work, or maybe a leader that you follow, and so somebody like that, that just shows up all of a sudden at your, at your house, you're, you're minding your own business, and so Elijah shows up, because Elijah has been told by God, Elisha, this young man is the next guy that I'm going to pick, right, so Elijah shows up, looks at Elisha, puts the, uh, the cloak on him, basically says, you're going to be the next great prophet. Now, Elijah is famous, but he's not always loved. He's both loved and hated. He's loved by some. He listens to what God says, but he's also hated. He's hated by, he's been hunted. He's been hiding out in caves. He's hated by the king's wife, Jezebel. Like he is a hated guy. So this is a big deal. This moment, basically what he's saying is, I have a big plan for you, but guess what? It's going to cause a lot of pain. It's going to cause a lot of suffering. And so Elisha in that moment does something. I think we're going to talk about taking the shot. I think he takes the shot. He weighs out the options. The Bible says this is how he responds to this call. Uh, He knows how difficult it's going to be, I think, even before he ever goes. And so he has to make a choice. Is he going to kind of put the, 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 the tools in the shed, close it up, try out this profit thing? If it gets too hard, come back and be a farmer. I mean, I got to be honest with you. If you ever do anything for God and you don't make sure to close the the book on the the thing you've done before that, you will always go back to that. Am I right? If you break up with somebody you're not supposed to date, but you keep their number in your phone, don't you always end up calling them again? Right? If you you decide you're not going to drink alcohol anymore because you keep getting drunk and you can't stop and you're going to quit and you're going to, you know, be healed from this and whole and move forward and not let it steal your life, but you keep a couple under your bed for when it gets stressful, you can go back to it. Right? If you, if you try not to look at pornographic images, but you decide to keep HBO and Cinemax, right? And all those other things that have all those things, and let's be honest, not even those, you don't even get, you can just do Netflix now. You can do anything, like you can just, and you keep all those things that don't have protection on there. Don't you always go back to that? Like boundaries, like it's just the way we work. So what does Elisha do? Elisha, the Bible says, takes his, 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 his plow and he starts a fire with it. You can just picture this. Starts a fire with it and then he takes all of his, his cattle and he kills them all. He doesn't even leave his favorite one in case he wants to come back to it. 
He kills all of the cattle. And so if you weren't mad at me before about killing the deer and you thought, man, you, you're mean and you killed Bammy, now you really should be mad, right? This dude kills all of his cattle just so he can have a meal, just so he can't go back to this. And the Bible says he sets out. And there's this really important, important passage or part in this, in this story uh, that I want to focus on today that I think is going to encourage you in, in, in your weight. Because the weight is really, really important. I, I, I think it's like this. What God does in us as we wait is as important as what it is we are waiting for. It's true. What, what God wants to do in us as we wait is as important on what we're, we're waiting for. Why? Because if you're not ready to, to hold on to what God has taken you, if you can't handle it, eventually you lose it. You'll, you'll lose it. He'll give you the dream job, but you're not ready to handle it. You lose it. He gives you the marriage you think you need, but you're not ready to be married. You, you lose it. He gives you what, you what you think you want, but you're not ready. So Elisha, watch, watch what the Bible says in, in the book of 1 Kings 19, verse number 21, the very end of it, this, this, this story, it says, then after he has this party, I just want you to focus on this one thing, then he sets out to follow Elijah. And I want you to underline, I want you to circle, I want you to write this down. The Bible says, and he becomes or he became his what? His servant. I want you to circle that word became. Because here, here, here's what happens in the Bible. We think he gets called and then all of a sudden he's the prophet. Like, like overnight success stuff. Listen, I need to explain to you something. There is no fast pass in the plan of God for your life. If you don't know what a fast pass is, you haven't been to an amusement park for some time. When I was a kid, you had to wait in line. And to be honest with you, they didn't even tell you how long it was. I mean, if you grew up in this area, there was a season of my life where you would get on line for, for Hercules, a.k.a. future neck problems at Dorney Park. <laughs> and it was, you know, the world's largest wooden roller coaster at the time, right? They took it down because people were getting concussions, right? And you would just get in line. There was, you didn't just skip to the front. You didn't just hop a fence. There was no you know, back, back way to go. You just got in line and, and you waited. And now we have this, these, these establishments, these rules, these ways around it where you can pay a little extra money and you get a fast pass or you get a ticket at Disney World and you come back sometime later. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't. All of us go through a season, and so Elisha gets called, right, to do this. And then, then if you read the Bible, what's so interesting, it's some of the most, uh, I would say, awful authorship that you've ever seen. Because if you introduce a character, shouldn't that character, you know, over the next few chapters, shouldn't you continue to develop and, and talk about and share, tell us what color his hair is, tell us how bloody that was, that was, tell us, you know, tell us how the meat, did he want it medium well or well done or rare, like, is, tell us all those things, right? And the Bible says that Elisha is introduced, and then if you keep reading, if you go to 1 Kings chapter 20, guess, what there, guess what's in there about Elisha? Nothing. And then you go to 1 Kings chapter 21, nothing. It's like a joke. Then you go to 1 Kings chapter 22, Nothing. So you have this dude, he just burnt his thing. Then you go to 2 Kings 1, another book, and there's still nothing. It's not until 2 Kings chapter 2 that we are reintroduced to Elisha. And so I did something, I'm like, that's, that's peculiar. Because if you read it quickly, you think, okay, he gets the mantle, he goes, he all of a sudden he starts doing these incredible things, speaking for God, you know, the miracles that Elisha was doing. But I did some studying about that word became. And in this season, from 1 Kings 19 to when Elisha actually becomes the prophet of God, guess how many years there is? Ten. Ten years. Some of you consider waiting like 30 minutes. I'm going to give you an opportunity, but if you don't answer this, some of you, you've been married, it's been like three or four years. Your husband or your wife is not the person that you want them to currently be right now. And you are at the point where you have come to the conclusion that God is not a God that wants you to wait around and waste your life. You need to force, you know, force your way out, be a, be a pain in the butt to them so they don't want to be with you, and find somebody else that can fix it. Some of you have been in a job, and you're like, it's a dead-end job. I've been here for two years. I've been doing what I'm supposed to be doing. People get promoted, and I don't get the promotion that I'm supposed to get. And meanwhile, Elisha gets called. He wasn't even looking for this, by the way. It's not like he was going, you know what? I'm going to position myself. Elisha's going to come by. I'm going to wave, wear his T-shirt, make sure we connect, you know, you know hit, hit each other up on Instagram or whatever other social media thing that we can do, show him what I can do, and be a part of his you know, posse, and then someday I can be it. He's just minding his own business. He didn't ask for this. 
And then he goes into a 10-year waiting period. And the question is, why does he go into that 10-year waiting period? And the, and the answer is because God needs to get him ready. He, he needs to get him ready. It's what I called a few years ago the gap period. The gap period. And the gap, if you, if you break it down to an acronym, would mean God-appointed preparation. That God will often in your life put you in a season to get you ready for what's, what's next. A new level always needs a new you. And so if God is going to take you somewhere new and do something incredible with your life, he first needs to get you ready. And so he puts you into what I will call a gap, God-appointed preparation. And some of you are in it right now. God is doing something in your life, and you weren't even aware of it. In the entire time you've been in the waiting process, you've just been trying to get out of it. And God says, if I get you out of it too early, you're going to wreck where I take you. So let me just give you a few reasons that the gap, uh, thoughts on the gap that, I, that I've started to realize in my own life. One is, is there is always a gap. There will always be a gap between being called and being ready. There will always be a gap between being called and, and, and being ready. Listen, some of you are called to be married, but you're not ready to be married. What do you mean I'm not ready? I got all of my dress picked out, and I got my colors, and I, I've been on a bridal magazine. It's almost been creepy, right? And I Pinterest boarded all this stuff, and I know I want to get married at a barn someday, and, and all, all these things. And like, I, what do you mean I'm not ready to get married? But you, 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 listen, you're called to get married, probably. Like someday you're going to be ready to get married, but you're not ready to get married. Well, how do you know I'm not ready to get married? Because you're not, you're not that secure. You're super insecure. You still look for the affection of, of a man. Or as vice versa, you still, you still rely too heavily on that. You still need his words or her words of affirmation instead of the Lord's words. And there's not somebody that you're going to find that's going to be able to fulfill all those things that you still need. And so if I bring that person into your life, you're going to put so much weight on them that they are going to literally die from the burden of your needs. You need to stop being so needy and you need to find your worth and your, and your security and your image and your identity in me. And when you figure that out, then you'll be ready to get married. Some of the other ones are like, I just, you know, I'm called to get married because God said not to have sex. I just need to have sex. So I know I'm supposed to, to, to get married, right? Meanwhile, 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 you're single and you can't stop looking at pornography. You just can't. And you think, you think when I get married, you know, this person will do all these things that I need. They're going to meet my needs. And I won't have this problem anymore. And I, I'm just going to tell you, if you don't allow the Lord to handle that, if you don't bring light to, to that, if you don't get help with that, if you don't get accountability with that, that comes right into your marriage and it will destroy your marriage. And so you might be called, right? Some of you, I mean, we can just keep going. Some, there's a guy, I'm called to be married, but I can't keep a job. Like I'm called. You are probably, listen, you are probably called to be married. Just because you're called doesn't mean you're ready. Some of you are like, I'm called to lead. Do you submit well? Do you do the right thing when your boss is not watching you? Do you work as hard for him that you would work for yourself? Are you a person of integrity? Do you show up on time? Do you not steal money from the company by, by not working? Are you on Facebook all day long? Are you dreaming about something else or are you actually making his dream a reality or her dream a reality? You might be called to lead, but it doesn't mean you're ready to lead. See, there's always a gap between being called and being ready. I can, I'll explain to you. When I, was, when I was in college, I was called to plant a church, pastor a church. I just, I just was. I was called to get married to my wife. I knew I was called from the moment that I saw her. She didn't hear that call yet, but I heard that call, and I picked it up, if you know what I'm saying. Like, I knew. But listen, when my, my first, second year, third year of college, I was not ready to do anything mature, anything like, I remember my, 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 my third year of college, I got engaged at college, which was always a dumb idea, right? As a 21-year-old, I got engaged. I bought her a ring. I went to Zales and got her the nicest ring I could afford, and I brought it to her, and we got engaged. And, and, and then we were planning our wedding, and then we had to postpone it. And the reason we had to postpone it is because I was called to get married, but I was not ready to get married. And the reason I was not ready to get married is at that point, I had a couple responsibilities. You know what my responsibilities were? My responsibilities were 15 hours of college credits. Just so you, that's five classes. I had to get up and I had to go to five classes. I worked at Applebee's, a couple shifts a week, and then Chili's, and I had one car payment. My parents paid for my college. They paid for my food at college because they bought me a meal plan. My one responsibility was pay for your car payment. Now, I'm not talking about a $400 car payment. I'm talking about a $140 a month car payment for a 1994 souped-up black Volkswagen Jetta. 
I begged my parents, says, let me get this. Let me upgrade from a, from a Ford Escort. I had a red Ford Escort with those things that used to choke you. And I said, let me, let me just get this black Ford Escort. I need an Escort. I need, I need a wife. And so if I don't have, if I have this Escort, I'm not going to be able to get a wife. I need a Jetta. And if I get this Jetta, and I remember this whole conversation I had, and then I didn't pay it. And I was five months behind on my bill. Meanwhile, I was engaged and planning to get married in October. This was, this was right around May. My parents were like, you're not ready to get married. I was called, but I wasn't ready. You see, Elisha is called to be the next prophet, but do you think he's ready? Do you think he's going to face the same things that he is facing on the farm that he's going to face in his future? When do you think the last time that somebody got mad at him for plowing the field and wanted to kill him? I mean, Elijah, prior to this scene, is in a cave, depressed, right? When he should be excited because he literally just had the greatest move of God in his life against the evil prophets and Jezebel and, and all the, the king. And he should have been excited. And meanwhile, he's depressed and he's carrying the weight and he's lonely. And now he's, you better believe he's like, sweet, you take this. And do you think if God would have put Elisha at that position that he would have lasted more than even a few days? See, there is always a gap. There was always preparation between when you're called and, and, and when you're ready. Getting called qual qualifies you to be used, but it does not quantify that it will actually happen. There's things in your life that God needs to get you ready for. Let me just give you a few more. Number two, uh, no one anywhere ever gets to skip the gap. No one anywhere in God's plan ever just shows up and God goes, you're ready. You have good genetics, you have a good family structure, you have nice teeth, you have a good voice, you have talent, you're ready. Let me just push you to the front of the classroom. Nobody gets to skip the line. Let me, let me, let me just kind of explain this to you. Uh, I love Chick-fil-A, right? And so I love Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, right? I love like all that. Get that reference if you listen to that. Okay, like I love, I love Chick-fil-A. And so one thing I hate about all fast food restaurants is when you get a kid's meal, I hate when they put the prize in the kid's meal. Uh, and the reason I hate the prizes is not because I'm anti-prizes, but I feel like it stops, it stops the kid from eating, right? And so I remember a few years ago, Harrison, we go to Chick-fil-A, and Chick-fil-A's prizes and, and, the kids, and the kids' things are like, they're questionable, right? It'll be, like, it'll be like, can you read this to me? And I'm like, why do I have to read a prize for a three-year-old? Like, this should just be self-explanatory. And so, uh, and, and, and I, I get it. They, they made the prize kind of questionable so that you can trade in and get an ice cream cone. And so I, I understand all that. Uh, but he loved the prizes. And so we would get there, his four-piece nugget, his french fries. I'd put them on the table, and he would immediately open the prize up. And if he opened the prize up before he ate, we're, telling, we're talking a 30-minute meal goes into two hours. And I love spending time with him, and I know he's growing up too fast, but I don't want to spend two, year, two, two, two hours at Chick-fil-A. And so I told him one time, I said, listen, you are not allowed to touch the prize until you eat the nuggets. You eat the four nuggets, you eat your french fries, you drink your drink, and then we will open the prize. If we will dissect it, I will tell you what this means in Greek and whatever else that you need. Here's how we're going to do it. And so I looked at him one day a few years ago, and I said, don't touch the prize. You don't open the prize up. And so I showed him four chicken nuggets. This is not asking a lot, right? Four chicken nuggets. Eat the nuggets. We'll get, the, we'll get the prize. And so it uh, wasn't very long. I know how long it should take. It wasn't very long. And all of a sudden, I look over his box. His box is empty, and he is opening his prize. And I said, what did you? He said, I ate my chicken nuggets. I said, there is no way, son, that you physically could have ate. You, 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 couldn't, you can't do that. So I'm looking around. I'm like, he's, he's a liar. Kids are liars, right? And so I'm like, he's a lion. And, and he does all the time. He, I, I got so many stories of, of Lincoln Harrison. I tell him, go and brush his teeth. He goes in the thing, turns the water on, wets his toothbrush, comes out. I said, you brush your teeth, yeah? I said, let me smell your breath. It smells like, you know, trash and butt mixture. And so I'm like, you didn't brush your teeth. He just faked it. And so he's like this. He's a little liar. He needs Jesus. And so I said, one day, I said, I said, did you eat the chicken? He said, yeah, I ate the chicken. I said, no, there's no way you eat the chicken. So I start looking around. He starts getting that guilty look on his face. And I look in his clothes. You know, there's no, no, no end to what he'll do. And look in his pockets, all those things. And finally, I look under his table. And there are his four chicken nuggets strategically placed. Like he pushed them back with his thing. And he's kind of got his feet in front of them. And the point of it is, listen, you can have the prize, but you don't get to skip eating the nuggets. And I'm going to tell you the same thing. You can get to the prize. 
You can have that relationship, that calling. You can have that door open for you, but you don't get to skip the gap. No one gets to skip over the gap. I want you to think about it. Joseph in the Bible waited many years between when he had a dream and when he saw God move. Joshua waited 40 years behind Moses before he got a chance to lead. David, many years. Elisha, 10 years. Peter waits three years, right, waiting on God and following Jesus. Even Jesus went through a waiting time. Before that he, that he went and started his earthly ministry, he went on a 40-day fast in the wilderness. Let me say, well, his was only 40 days because he only had three years. So if you would like God to only give you three more years, maybe he could put you in a 40-year waiting cycle or a 40-day waiting cycle. But most of you are going to have 80, 50, 40, 30, I don't know how old you are, many more years to live on this earth. And so God will take you into waiting seasons and no one gets to skip the line. And let me just give you two more quickly as we wrap this up. Uh, three, this is important. The larger the future, what I've noticed is many times the longer the gap. The, the larger the future, the longer the gap. I want to I teach you a principle as we kind of end this, this. But Luke 12, these are the words of Christ. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be on the screen, so just listen to me. But he says, from everyone who has been given much, this is important, much will be demanded. Watch what else he says. Uh, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. That means you should be careful before you ask God for responsibility uh, because you're going to have to give an account for it. And so not only, this thing, this thing about seeking the plan, the power, the presence of God, it's not, it can't be selfish. So when you're talking about a marriage, like if your prayer is, God, just give me a wife or a husband so I can just be happy, that is not marriage, trust me. Happy is an awful goal for marriage. I've been like, my marriage is just not happy. Yeah, marriage and happy are two different words, right? That's not the point of being married. And I'm not, I love my wife, but not every day is she going, oh, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm so glad you talked to me in college all those years ago and brought me Applebee's and all this stuff. But some days that it is simply our commitment to each other and God's future and his calling to our lives that keeps us going. Marriage is deeper. I want, I want it to be about my testimony. I want people to see grace in our marriage. I want them to see real love in our marriage. I want our kids to be raised in a home with real love and mercy and forgiveness and all those other things. Man, your relationship or your prayer to God cannot be a selfish thing. God, I, want to, I just want to get married. Why? Why? I guess it's going to be a good, big responsibility. See, and if it's a big responsibility, if it's been entrusted to you, much is going to be required of you. So God, just give me that open door. Give me that influence. Let me get that influence. Let me get that spot of influence in my job and at my school. Let me, let me have that. Listen, if God gives that to you, uh, there's going to be a weight and a responsibility to that. To who much is given, much is required. And so the, the, the point is, before you ever get to the weight of that, you need to understand that the larger that the future is, oftentimes the longer that the gap is. You know what we know about, about Elisha in these 10 years? Uh, it's summed up in one sentence. I think it's in 2 Kings 3. He says, this is Elisha who has spent the last 10 years, doesn't say 10 years, spent the last years washing the hands of Elijah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what he did. Front row seat to the man of God, carrying his jacket and his cloak and washing his hands. Not, not preaching, not, not getting followers, not starting, not starting you know, a page for himself not making a big deal about himself, 10 years of just following the man of God. Why? God's getting him ready. What he's about to do, the Bible says that he would do even greater things than Elijah. But in order for him to do even greater things, he had to go through 10 years of preparation. And it was not because he was bad or messed up. It was because of the size of God's plan for his life. The, the, the larger the future, the longer that the gap is. And, and the last thing you need to under, understand that's really important is the main purpose. I mean, why does God make me wait? The main purpose is just to learn to handle it. You can't handle it, you won't hold it. Eventually, you'll lose it. God's plan, without his preparation, always leads to disaster. Always. God, God's plan, without him getting you prepared, will always lead to disaster. In other words, before you can handle being known, you need to be able to handle being not seen. That, 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 that's period. Before you can handle power, you need to learn handle, how to handle to submit. Before you can learn to lead, you need to learn how to be led. Before you can stand on a platform in public, you need to be able to serve in private. 
It's all about preparation and getting ready. The main purpose of the gap is to learn to handle God's call on your life. Why does he put him in this? He's getting him ready. Why, why are you waiting? He's getting you ready. That's how you look at it. God, what are you getting? I don't even know what you're getting ready for, but I know you're getting me ready. So I'm going to keep seeking your face. I'm going to keep waiting on you. I'm going to stop being stressed out. Listen, uh, I, I understand. I understand it. Because I have felt, uh, even in this year, I'm going, okay, God, I'm waiting on you again. Like we started our fifth campus, and I know it's not, that's not it. I just know, I just know it. I know that there's more. I know there's many, many, many more people that need to know Christ. I, I know that with all my heart. Uh, even in the seasons where you, you just get tired, you're like, I don't want to do it anymore. Like you just, you just know God is going gonna, is gonna to move. And so what's your job in this season? Uh, my job is just to wait on the Lord and anticipation. Am I just sitting on a chair? No, I'm going to stay faithful. I'm, gonna, I'm really determined. I'm going to keep, keep my head down, keep my mouth shut. I'm going to keep serving the Lord with gladness. I'm going to keep believing this is the day the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. But I'm going to keep waiting on the Lord, and that's all I know how to do because that's what I've done for the last 11 years. Why is Journey here? Because we just waited. We waited long enough. I tried it on my own. I tried to find buildings, tried to open up doors, and then I just said, you know what? I'm going to wait on the Lord, and God has opened up doors. And if it's not God's will, you can't force it. If it is God's will, guess what? You can't stop it. So I read this this week because I think all of us get into seasons of waiting. We're like, okay, God, now uh, let's do it. Come on, show up. God, do what only you can do. And in those seasons, you listen to voices. You ever, you ever done this? And uh, the voices, I think, the voice of Satan, your enemy. And I think that those voices are very easy to tell. Uh, when you're going through the seasons, it's very easy to tell, but maybe you're confused by it and you don't know if it's, if it's God, if it's you, if, it, you know, if it's Satan, if it's your sinful nature, if it's the Bible, if whatever it is. So I read this week, and I want to close with this, uh, that if you're in a season of waiting, he, here's what Satan loves to do. You ready? Satan loves to rush you. He loves to frighten you. He loves to push you. He loves to confuse you. He loves to stress you out. He loves to discourage you. He loves that you worry. You feeling all that? If you are, he loves it because you're in a season of waiting, but you're not embracing it. You're actually stressed out. And you are getting close to the brink of manipulating something and making your own move and getting in the way of the things that God has for your life. Can I tell you what, what God does in a season of waiting? I, I love this. He'll reassure you. He'll do it through scripture. He'll do it through a friend. He'll do it through the, the Holy Spirit. He'll, he'll reassure you. He'll lead you. He'll calm you. He, he'll encourage you. And he'll comfort you. If you would just wait, so just wait. If you wait on the Lord, he'll renew your strength. You'll run and not grow weary. You'll walk and you will not faint. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? And as we transition, you know, these, these moments are, are, are significant. I think even more so than, than everything that I just said because in essence what happens is man steps out of the way and hopefully the presence of God is allowed to, to just move and that, that's what we want. we want we want we want to worship God I want to lift up the name of Jesus I want to I want him to fill this place as we draw as he draws men and women to himself we want to serve people uh, and show them how, how much God loves them and cares for them and, and all these elements are important we want to open up the word of God and and enjoy his truth and his promises and stand on them and celebrate them and be encouraged by them. And now ultimately at the end, this is why we close our eyes and we bow our heads. It's not just so that we can, you know, kind of end this thing out. But I want you to stop worrying about me right now. And, and the person who's speaking or whatever else is going on, any distraction you're facing. And I just wonder if that's you. I wonder if you are in a season of waiting. I wonder if you're about to even go into a season of waiting. I wonder how you've handled it in the past. And I wonder if you're tempted to handle it like that again. I, I cannot tell you. And this is not to scare you, uh, but I can't tell you how many people uh, that I have watched uh, sacrifice in the wait, like, like give up, make an allowance, marry somebody they shouldn't have married, take a job they shouldn't have 
of taking quit on a job or, 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 or move or do something that they wouldn't necessarily have done before because they're frustrated and been waiting on God for a long time. And it's hard as a pastor when you speak with people and you watch them because you're part of the life and you watch them move away from what God wants to do in their life. Because ultimately we have free will. We get to decide, we get to make decisions, and our decisions, they, they create our destiny. And here's the thing, you can't fix the decisions you've made, and the great news is God's able to continue to work in spite of that. Many times, I've watched him do it in my own life. But I, I want to talk specifically to the person uh, that's been waiting in a marriage, or waiting for an opportunity, or waiting for a door to open, or waiting for that call, or waiting for that miracle, and you are on the brink of quitting. And I want to encourage you, just keep, keep waiting. You, you've sought the face of the Lord. He's going to send you an answer. You've sought the face of the Lord. He's going to open up a door. You've sought the face of the Lord. Sometimes he doesn't even open. Sometimes he closes the door. But he will speak. If you listen, he will respond. You're his child. He loves you more than you can imagine. Some of you are stressed out and you're worried and you're anxious and you're fearful. And I believe the Spirit of the Lord is going to move in this place and there's going to be peace. There's going to be joy. There's going to be the ability to rest. Some of you can't even sleep at night right now. You are so full of anxiety because you don't know what's going to happen. And it doesn't mean your situation is going to change overnight, but your spirit is going to change. The Spirit of the Lord is going to fill your place and rest is going to fill your soul right now. The other thing I want to happen at the end of our services, and we pray every week and believe uh, that we'll be a church, that God would see fit uh, to bring somebody on Sunday that, that wouldn't typically go to church, wouldn't typically show up. And I pray, God, make us a church where people who don't typically sit in a church feel comfortable. God, God, God trust us with that. Because here's the thing about every one of us. Every one of us is God's creation. Not every one of us is God's children. We hear that oftentimes. You're a child of God when you're adopted into his family through a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you are his creation. And his desire is to be your father. So my prayer is, God, would you bring those people that you've created, would they feel comfortable at this church? Would they be drawn to your presence, Lord? Would you see fit to trust us with that so we can share the good news of Jesus Christ? This is not a religious place at all, at all. Religion is, is, is man trying to earn the approval of God. This is not that place. We are about a relationship with, with, with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And we don't believe that it matters if you're a good or a bad person, that God will take you in whatever state that you are, but he won't leave you there. He'll change you, he'll forgive you, and he'll set you free. You see, I have a relationship with God because I was a sinner, and I confessed Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I was forgiven and set free. And the Bible says, I've been adopted into the family of God. And the truth is that God is here right now. It says, he knocks at the door of people's hearts that they would let him in. He would come in. He would save them. He would set them free. And we've been doing this for, for many, many years. And we preached on all different topics. But the one thing we do is we always land in the same spot, the exact same spot. I believe there's somebody in our church every week that if I said, hey, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you would say no. But I also believe there's somebody that would say, but I want to, but I don't know how. The Bible says if you would call on the name of the Lord, you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he died on a cross for your sins, that he rose in power three days later, that if you believe that message, that that is how you're made right with God through the forgiveness of your sins, the death of Jesus Christ, if you believe that and you confess that, the Bible says you'll be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. Your shame will be gone. And so, so here we are. We've landed right here. I'm about to ask you the exact same question we've asked for many, many years. And we have you respond the same way we've always had you to respond. No matter where you go, the universal signal of surrender is to lift your hands. That's it. And that's essentially what you're doing. You need to surrender your life to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. You give up. I'm not going to run on my, away from Him. I'm not going to try to handle life on my own. I'm not going to carry my bitterness and my resentment and my anger. I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. 
So I'm going to ask you in a second, and if you would be bold enough and have enough courage, but maybe even not that, maybe you are so tired of living the life that you're living, you're tired of being hopeless and lost and feeling broken and having anxiety and everything else that people struggle with, and you say, you know what, I'm tired of doing it on my own. Jesus, come into my life. If you're real, here I am. Here I am. I surrender my life to you. And so to every one of our campuses right now, we're going to do that. Montgomeryville, Limerick, Royersford, Plymouth meeting right here in Phoenixville. I don't know you, but I know God loves you. And I know God has a plan for your life. And today he wants to bring you into his family. He wants to be a father to you. He wants you to feel his presence. He wants you to know his love. But he's not going to force himself on you today. You need to receive him. I'm going to receive the gift of Jesus Christ right now in my life. So friend, if that's you, if that's why you're here, you didn't even know why you were here, but you know now that you were here and you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. I know I need to get my life right with him. Today, I want him to come into my life at all of our campuses right now. Would you just respond by simply shooting your hand straight up in the air and say, you know what? Hey, today's going to be my day. I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm going to ask him to come in and save my sins. Come on, if you're in Montgomeryville, Ian's there and in, in, in Limerick, Taylor's there and Allison is in Royersford and Vinay is in Plymouth meeting. You say, you know what? I need to respond. When you respond, they're going to let me know. Hey, there's somebody in Phoenixville right now. Thank you so much. There's somebody in Limerick. Yes, yes, yes. Is there anybody else say, hey, Pastor, that's me. Just keep your hand up real quick. Put it back down, and we're going to pray with you all over our house. We're going to pray with you all over our house. Let's begin to pray, church. Thank you for this day. But thank you for your word that it never returns void. Thank you that it encourages us, it strengthens us, and emboldens us. Lord, Lord, it gives, us, it gives us wisdom to keep going and direction and guidance. And Lord, we seek you, Lord. We listen to you. We obey you. We follow you. And Lord, as we, we, we make a commitment to you and we enjoy your presence, Lord, I'm grateful for those that came into this place. And man, they're experiencing life and forgiveness and grace and mercy and a hope they've never had before. Lord, it's been so difficult for them to face life. And they've been so hurt. They've been so riddled with shame and anger and bitterness. But Lord, right now, as they give their life to you, Jesus, you release them from all that. They're leaving this place. And Lord, the Bible says, if we come to you, if we're weary and heavy laden, that it's in you that we find rest. Lord, it's in you that our sins are forgiven. Lord, where they've listened to voices of condemnation and shame, Lord, they, they don't hear that voice anymore. They hear love. They hear mercy. They hear forgiveness. They hear acceptance. Lord, we're grateful that freedom is in this place. We love you. We love you and we're glad that we get to worship you. We're glad that we get to come into these rooms and lift up our hands and share and sing our sing the songs, Lord, and hear your word. And Lord, we're grateful for all that you continue to do, Lord, as we leave this place. We leave this place on mission, Lord. Lord, we want to go seek and save the lost as a church. And we are thankful for the opportunities that we have to do that week in and week out. Jesus, thank you for one more Sunday that you've given us. Thank you for all that we have to rejoice with. Thank you for all that you're gonna do. Jesus name we pray and one more time church would you shout amen come on let's clap together one more time